All right, welcome back to another video. Uh, one of my good buddies, Kevin. We're out here in uh, Chautauqua, Kansas at, uh, what do you call it, Neo Show River and Appen? Yep. Yeah, so we're just gonna, yeah. So beautiful out here. It's a nice, it's gonna be a hot day, so it's nice and breezy right now. So we're just gonna walk around this napping and uh, see if we can't get some uh, some good products. What are we looking for? Uh, a little bit of plant, maybe some uh, exotics, you know, I guess whatever they have to offer. Yeah, so we're just checking it out, so it should be pretty good. So let's go ahead and go through this, all right. My name's Aaron. Aaron, I talked to you the other day. Yeah. I was starting that YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. poor Pete's. Tools. Yep, yeah. I'm, I'm all about hand tools. Man, this stuff's awesome right here. Uh, that knife in the back over there, what, obsidian? Yep. I think this is called uh, banded obsidian, maybe? Really? That knife is... Did you make that yourself? Yeah. Really? Dang, that is nice. You're quite the craftsman. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what's a knife like that go for? Um, I'd probably sell that one for 50 60 bucks. Yeah? Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah. So do you, is this your business or is this a uh, hobby? It's, it's, I host the nap in. It's yeah, the, yeah. The Ocean River nap in. And four years ago, I heard what a nap in was and I wanted to go to one. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to make one right here. Awesome, man. Like, yeah, this is the fourth year and it's great. Yeah. And cool. you were into hand tools. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I use modern hand tools. Which okay. Is copper, stuff yeah. like that. But there's a guy here who uses authentic tools. He uses other rods and uh, deer antler. Okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Are you a flint knapper? I didn't even know what the word meant. I go, well, I, just, I, said, I make arrow hands. Uh -oh. And he goes, well, yeah, yeah, that's flint knapping. Huh? He said, I know a guy, and he lived up on Greasy Creek. He actually knew D.C. Greasy Creek. Yeah, well. No, not greasy. It's greasy, greasy, greasy creek. Uh, Dane Martin and DC Waldorf were partners in the chip steel. They were like the grassroots stuff. Yeah. We, they're, the only video that I could find out there was DC's Art of Flint Napping and the companion book. And that's how I learned to flint nap. Beyond teaching myself <laughs> until exactly. five or six or so. <laughs> Did you break that, Calvin? Oh, my oh. God. Party foul. Sure hey, hey, this is Pete, that guy's talking about. Hey, what's up, man? Oh, yeah. Hey, is it okay if I film you guys? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. awesome, man. So what got you into flint napping? When I was a kid, I uh, lived in southwest Missouri, and, and I used to walk a lot of plowed fields with my grandpa looking uh -huh. for, for points, and uh, always wondered how they made them. Had no clue. And in those days, I'm a little bit older than most of these guys sitting here around, and you know they, they know what YouTube and you know, cell phones are and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, I, I was self-taught for the first two or three years, and then I met a guy who happened to know people that knew how to flint map, and that they knew D.C. Waldorf, who's fairly uh, prominent in flint mapping, and he had a video and a book out, and that's how I got into the napping part of it. And that was about 23 years ago, 23, four years ago. Oh, wow. But I used modern tools up until five years ago. I, I quit using them completely, and I switched over to all traditional tools, all stone and bone tools. Oh, man. Would, would you be able to show some of your tools Absolutely. that you yeah. use? Uh, in fact, if you, you know, I know you do some editing and whatever yeah. else. I can set out some stuff and, you know, look at whatever different types of, like, billets or a hammer stone. Okay. And you can see wear patterns and how they're used as a whatever. So Yeah. Just, if you let me know what it is that you want to look at. Yeah, like, just, just different types of hand tools and how you use them. You know what I mean? Well, and, you know, most of uh, these hand tools typically are going to be modified natural materials. You know, okay. This is a, a moose antler. This okay. is the base of a moose tie. It's just been shaped down to use the, the hardened bone part of it, and that's used as a percussor to actually strike the stone with. Okay. Or to hit on a punch like this. Okay. Uh, I think it, this one's a little bit past the stage where I would use that. So as you start working it down, you're going to get in some more finer the, tools. Yeah. When you start off, every everything in flint mapping is, is exactly the same. It's just all proportionate. So 
as the mass of your biface reduces, then you have to reduce the mass of your percussor, the mass of your, your pressure. You know, all that just keeps getting smaller, but it's the same angles, it's the same principles. Okay. You just have to adjust the, the force. Awesome, man. So, this right here is a shaft punch, and I made this from an old bow that broke. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Now, you've seen people that use like a billet as a percussor like this. A lot of them use a copper bopper or the modern type nappers. Well, all I'm doing is being able to have this in a stationary place. Just imagine that's the same thing, and I can put the platform that I want to strike, hold it at the angle and support it, and then strike the, the percussor, and they call it indirect percussion. Okay. And what it does is it enables you to be able to, to direct force with a lot more force, but your accuracy is almost guaranteed because you've already placed your tool where you want the plate to come off. Okay. See, and then you get a cleaner termination. Yeah. Nice plate. Yeah. Set up your platform, then you set it underneath the punch. Off the tool. Okay. Every one of these that come off potentially is a hand tool. It's that's a slicer. A lot of blade force technology was used in our in archaeological time. So awesome. What I do is I just keep following the ridges and the, the high and low spots. That's what it is. Isn't it? Well, what's the point in uh, uh, rubbing that right there? Well, I'm, you're, I'm trying to take away a weaker edge. It's what I call like a crumple zone. Okay. In the 40s, 50s, cars had solid rigid frames and they were death traps. When you hit something with them, you hit it with the full force. When you hit a brick wall, you hit it at the same velocity. Well, now sure. new cars, they built in crumple zones that they absorb shock. Yes. Well, you, that's a bad thing in flint napping. I want to transfer all of the force and the velocity into that rock so you grind back or press out of the way areas that will break away easy that will rob energy going into the piece. And that's a sharp? A sharpened edge will break away easier, obviously. Ah, uh, I got away. you. So it will it will absorb more of the force before it detaches the flake so you'll get longer and cleaner flakes. I'll, I'll purposely short flake one on, on another piece of material here in a minute to show you what I mean. See, and depending on the angle that I hold this at, I redid it. I can direct them. I'm trying to direct them into where they're just feathering in, where you get a nice, yeah, convexity. You can adjust angles. But the, the, the reason I like this particular setup is because I can do odd angles and hold, okay. hold techniques that people that are doing it either direct or with a different method than this can't hold it. I can hold this up off my leg and tilt it and take plate off edges that work out. Okay. And thin the, the piece and still keep the body that I want. That's such a clean break. You know, I can bring from this corner into this area here. Yeah. Start working back to the other side. What kind of stone is that? This is Reed Springs. Okay. This is a, a local stone that I pick up, uh, oh. self collected. Okay. What most of this in here is. You have a particular like, style that you like to well, and that's why that's 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 with the Check out that flute. There you go. There you go. There's something. Jeez. His pressure flute. That pressure? Oh, indirect. Indirect, yeah.
And I didn't think I didn't. That was my that was that was the worst. Um, that was the worst side. <laughs> yeah, that was the side that was That's giving me nice. trouble. Thanks. That's awesome. Ain't even right. That's like, right. That's like, right. That's like, 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 do it. That went, that went too well. Sign it and put it in your case. Well, it's not done yet. I still got a print plate. Yeah. So I got a question. When you're working with like copper uh -huh. and metals, as opposed to antler and, and stone, is it is it a more natural feel, more like... Um, like the vibration, the harmonics of it. it. It is a lot less of a like with the copper. You can feel it's a almost a dull thud because the, most of them are, are lead filled or solid copper, yeah, and they're a lot now. denser than these materials. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they do have some of these. Depending on like these tools are very susceptible. There, you see how this one's getting kind of torn up. Yeah, if you want to like get a close up of the okay. bit area, and you can see oh, how. Okay. How ratted up that is? Yeah. The the, uh, the humidity will actually soften. It'll soak into these, and they'll actually be tougher to work with a little bit, depending on the weather. Really? In dry, arid conditions, bone is amazing, or antler. But when it's really humid, I like to use bone because it's more dense and it soaks up less humidity. And this this is getting definitely softer. So it it kind of changes the rules and the way that you have to deal with the rock. You have to maybe set up platforms a little weaker because your tool is a little softer. Yeah. Uh, and you can actually hear the hardness difference. It's almost like if you were to hit something with a brass hammer or with a steel hammer. Yeah. And you can tell the difference in the ting when it hits. A, a soggy antler will sound way different than one that's really dry and crisp. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it feels right. That's one of the reasons why when I switched over these, it's like I told you, I don't care how people map, what tools they use. It's all, you know, flint mapping, but this this just speaks to me. I really like that bag. I didn't notice that at first. Right. Yeah. That that bag on your uh Oh here. On your uh what do you call that? An issue well, stick or it's uh like a shaft punch. Yeah. Shaft bow. punch. And I use a lot of the guys, when they do this, they use a shaft punch and they go under this leg and they set it on this side and they get it here. Right. My back issues, when I twist like that, it pinches nerves. So I had to come up with a way to modify it. And I'm the only person that I've ever seen with this type of setup. This is a counterweight or a friend of mine. Now, this is an artifact. This, is, this came from an overhang shelter in a creek bank, northwest Arkansas. And I bet you've seen this from your area. You know what that is. Oh, it's, I've never seen that. That's that that's hematite. It's heavy. That's hematite. That that was found about 50 miles from where that formation is, and I think that that was probably like a hide breaker. Yeah. That, that so, was really. Like, you know, you have a buffalo hide uh, stakes out, and that heavy weight of that, and you can feel the patina. Like if if on this side of it, if you were not working it naturally, you have it like this. And you're pushing and pulling back and forth, and you're using these like that for that weight to break them. Look how polished and patina that is. Yeah, this side's not. That's that. Now you think about carrying everything you own on your bag, and, and that was important enough that you carried it 50 miles from where it's found. Right. That was something important. Yeah. So that's my. I use that as a. Did you find that? I did not. It was a gift from a friend of mine. Oh, wow. What a gift. Yeah, I agree. Scap Creeks are a, a deep notch type of a point, and a lot of people feel like they were punch notched. So, this, I don't know if this will break, but we'll just give it a shot here. I broke this one. Yeah, I don't have the copper in. So, you just take your punch, and it's kind of a screwdriver type shapes okay 
flop right up against the edge of your platform. And you just tap it. Get a, get a notch started. There's one on the other side, and you just keep walking it back and forth. This guy right now is hating me because he's like, man, notching's not supposed to be that easy. <laughs> right? Yep. yep. Twist it a bit. Hands are slick. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, that's just... That's amazing. That's deep. <laughs> right? I mean, I broke or just balled up on me from using the handler. I can't get it, you know. Or, you know. <laughs> well, I'm just about, it's about to stall if the I don't steam, get this notch or this flake that I need. The same rules apply. You can stall them just as bad with it. Yeah. I also got to work on getting mine that thin, too, you know. Maybe it worked okay, out. Okay, there went the flake. You will. And then as you go in, you want to make sure that you're dragging the edges oh. to, to keep from big, that burr will grab the edge of your tool and then your tool actually will get rough too. So you have to constantly be aware of, of the edges of your tool and the edges of your, of your channel. You just do that too fast. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's a little, this one's stalling a little bit on it right here. I'm trying not to break one the first time on camera here, you know. No, I'm just... Sometimes it gets in there and it'll stall out. <laughs> Let's get it. Yeah. I think the humidity is, is hurting my, my punches a little bit because it's really not grabbing like it should. You know, that's something I never would have thought of. I think about it with wood. And it does. Metal, yep. it, you, you know, the things I'm, I work with more. But it does. It definitely affects some antler pieces worse than others. This one's about a little bit loose, I think. But bone's more. Well, bone is denser than the antler, so it, does, it doesn't seem to be as affected by the humidity there. I finally got that flake out there, so I think it will commute or continue now, though. If it doesn't break. You see, just keep, I mean, as long as you continue to, to watch the, keep the shock from breaking the piece. My goodness. And that's can, what that magic anvil he's got? This right here, it, it absorbs a lot of that extra. It doesn't allow that punch oh, to go as deep. Okay. I'm hitting up against it, and you and can notice stopping. it. Yeah. Well, I'm actually setting this kind of against the the pro, or the or uh, platform and the, and the anvil at the same time. And you hear how it gets solid? Right. See how it's rattly sounding? Yeah. And then there's a solid sound. Well, when yes. it hits that solid sound, what it's doing is that force is making contact with the support underneath it. And giving it a very light controlled. See? So each time that you do that. Mm. So you can't just do this against your leg. Oh, no. You no. Can. Well, <laughs> with, with leather, you can, but it's a different strike. It's a quicker. Yeah. And you have to commit. And you're. Your punch can't be wedge shaped. It has to almost be completely, Squared. you know, like flat because it's going to drive through. And actually, this one here, if, see, if it goes much farther than that, it's going to split that point. But this keeps it from, it can't go that deep. So it's kind of a, a fail safe to keep it from splitting your point apart. So that makes sense. Kids in the back, you know, the the yeah, my dad. Mm. Only you didn't have that concrete in there. Oh, I know. I told you. <laughs> Did I not tell you that that stuff was going to be? That's what killed me on it. Yeah. I hit this area right this when I was making the point, and the, the texture was so much different, and I couldn't, I couldn't get the flakes to go through it. And this one, you know, it's kind of an insult to injury. I'm been able to take them in there. If it goes much farther though across here, it'll break. But this is a just a piece of, of bone and. I think this is axis deer, and that's what the notch looks like. My goodness.
Yeah. yeah. Well, if you want to check out some of my work, uh, it's New Age Neanderthal. I've got a YouTube channel and uh, also got a little Etsy shop under the same name. So thanks a lot. Hey, thank you for watching the video. I sure enjoy making these videos for you. But I wanted to take this opportunity at the end of this video just to say thank you to each and every person who stopped what they were doing, let me record them, nag them, ask them a bunch of questions. And uh, Kevin and I were just real excited just to learn and uh, learn new tricks and tips and get inspired. And uh, it's pretty special. It's a special day. I really got to stop what I was doing, unwind from uh, the busy lifestyle I have, and make my first arrowhead. So, goodbye for now.